My name is John Scalzi. I am from Bradford, Ohio, and I'm in town for the Iowa City Book Festival. Well, uh, there's always, of course, the where do you get your ideas question, which I get a ton of. Uh, and my answer to that always is the, the ideas are not the problem. Ideas are super easy. Like, here is an idea for you. A cat and a bar of chocolate, they solve crime. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. And that's actually what the secret is. The secret is not uh, where do you get your ideas, but how do you filter the good ideas from the bad ideas? And that's the actual real question people should be asking, and I wonder why they don't ask that uh, as often. The other question I always get a lot is uh, what's going on with the movie stuff, because a number of my uh, works are either uh, currently being adapted for film or for TV, and depending on what day it is, you know, that answer may vary. Well, my favorite quiet place for writing is, in fact, my office at home. Um, and it's kind of great because, you know, my daughter is off at school during the day, my wife is off at her work, uh, so the only person who is there who is human is me, and the pets know not to bother me while I'm writing. So generally speaking, that's kind of where I go, and that's in fact, with the exception of Agent to the Stars, which was written long before all the rest of them, all of my books have been primarily written in my office at home. The environment I find most difficult to work in is uh, basically an airplane or when I'm traveling. I travel quite a lot these days going to book festivals and on tour dates and conventions and so on and so forth. Um, and it becomes enough of a uh, thing that happens to me that I, it, it becomes uh, an issue for me when I am on a deadline, for example, because when I'm traveling I find it very difficult to write, so that's three days that I'm not really writing. I'm learning to get over it. The very last uh, part of The End of All Things was written in a hotel room in Australia uh, because I was there uh, and I was just hard up on a deadline and I couldn't avoid it. So I started it on the airplane to Australia, which was actually great because I was stuck there for 17 hours anyway. I wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, and I finished it in Perth. Well, the thing about social media is, um, to some extent, I was on it before I even became a novelist. I mean, the blog, whatever, uh, was founded in 1998, uh, which was long before my first novel came out, which was in 2005. Um, so in one sense, I've always been there. Uh, and, in, and in many ways, it's kind of a, been a, an outlet for me long before I even thought about you know, taking the books and you know, trying to get them published. Uh, but for another thing, I find that there are actually quite a lot of authors who are on social media and, and possibly more than should be because certainly PR people uh, will tell authors, oh, you should be on Twitter or you should be on Facebook or you should have a blog or all the, and all that sort of stuff. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of writers for whom that's kind of taxing. It's kind of an imposition. They don't like it and they, so they, they do it in a very sort of grudging fashion. Um, and that doesn't help you at all. If you are not actually enjoying uh, being on social media, um, it's going to show and, and nobody's going to be happy. I enjoy social media. I mean, like I said, I've been doing the blog for 17 years now. I've been doing Twitter since 2008. Um, it's enjoyable to me and I would be doing it uh, even if I didn't have books to promote. And as a matter of fact, the vast majority of what I put online has absolutely nothing to do with promoting the books per se. What they just are are, are me having fun and talking to friends and fans. Um, if it became something where I felt I was obliged to do it for the books or that it was purely for marketing, I don't think I would be anywhere as interested in it. because, And I don't think the people who are uh, reading me would be as interested either. I mostly at these days recharge my batteries by sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> which sounds really boring, but quite honestly, a good nap is amazing. Um, I do find that when I am done with a book, when I've written the book and sent it off, um, I need like a couple of weeks just to let my brain turn to jello. Um, and part of it is, is because um, when you, especially when you get near the end of the book and you're just trying so hard to finish it and get everything done and hit that deadline, um, it's very taxing. Um, and so having that moment where you just go, done, you know, time to play video games and shoot zombies in the head um, is actually hugely important. I think it's really important for uh, authors and writers and other creative people to give themselves permission to do nothing for a little while. You don't want to make a habit of it, 
Um, but for me, um, just you know, letting the world know I, I'm done, and if you want me for the next three weeks, you shouldn't expect anything more than monosyllable answers from me. Um, I think that that is the right thing for me, and I think it's the right thing for a lot of creative folks. So, actually, the word I use too much is actually. I'm aware when I use a word too much because I go back through it before it comes out and, uh, and I notice it's like, geez, I use that word a lot. Um, editors will call attention to it because that's their job. Um, and then uh, readers, and particularly now, um, folks who listen to audio versions will draw my attention to things. One of the things that the audio uh, listeners have brought my attention to is I do the thing with dialogue tags where you know, let's go to the store, he said. All right, she said, what do you want to buy there? Um, and I tend to use he said and she said more than other sorts of uh, uh, dialogue tags. And when you're reading, it's fine because that your brain sort of sees it, but you don't dwell on it. But when someone is reading it in audio, in order for the book to be unabridged, they have to put every single he said, she said, he said, she said in there. Uh, and if you do enough of that while you're listening to it, it becomes terrible. Um, so as a result, particularly in the last several books, um, I've dropped a lot of dialogue tags um, because my listeners have said, hey, are you aware you do this? And the answer was, yes, I was aware I, I, I did this. But it used to be that I only had to worry about them for the books. Now I have to worry about the audio as well. No, not really. I mean, I've been in a very fortunate position with my work that basically everything I've wanted to do, I've been able to do. Um, I, I kind of had the enviable position where I basically tell my publisher, this is the book I'm going to be doing. And they say, okay, you know, um, and uh, they trust me to basically make it readable and enjoyable. So, for example, um, Red Shirts, which was a book about um, the extra characters in science fiction movies, the ones who are always doomed. It's basically been an understood joke in science fiction and fantasy for the last 20 years. Everybody knows what a red shirt is, and everybody knows the five-minute skit where the red shirt goes, oh my god, I'm doomed, what do I do? Um, and I think in some ways if I had pitched it as I want to do a book about these characters, uh, somebody might have objected and said, well, you know, we all know this. It's already been kind of done. Um, and instead, I just went ahead and I did it, and I kind of delved into it further than I think most people did. I went beyond that five-minute comedy skit and found out what was really going on with them. Um, and as a result, the book was a, you know, a pretty large hit. It won the Hugo Award for that year for Best Novel. Um, and, uh, and that was simply just because I decided that was something I wanted to do. I've been very fortunate that Tor, who is my publisher, whenever I say, I want to try this, um, their response is always, okay, it's worked for you so far, let's see how it works. Do I think writing is spiritual? It's not for me, um, but at the same time, I understand why a lot of writers might call it that. Um, what I would call it, um, particularly when it is, um, when everything is going and everything is clicking, uh, there is a uh, there is a psychologist named Mahali Csikszentmihalyi, and he would talk about this concept of flow. And the concept of flow is you are so engrossed in your work that you're not thinking about the fact that you're doing work. You're not thinking about anything else. You're just so engaged in it that everything in your body uh, and everything in your mind is all in concert, doing that one thing, uh, and it almost feels like muscle memory. It almost feels like an automatic process. And then when it's done, you look at what has happened and you're like, how did I get here? You are in the flow. Um, and for me, um, that is not a spiritual thing, although I can see why a lot of people would consider it spiritual, but I certainly do enjoy it and I certainly do appreciate it when it happens. When you get to that point in a book where you know where you want to go with it, where you are very confident that it's going to work and that all ha you have to do now is set it down, right? Um, when you get to that point, um, it can feel like a heightened experience. It can be, if that's the metaphor you're used to, a religious experience or a spiritual experience um, because it feels like the story is moving through you um, and that you don't have to make any effort to get that story told.
so yeah, I totally get why people say it's spiritual. I don't think it's spiritual, um, but I get where they're coming from and that if that's the word they want to use for it, that's all right by me. Who is a writer? A writer is a person who writes. It's not a mystical thing. Um, and anybody who uh, wants to write uh, and who actually sits down and puts words on a page, they're a writer. I'm not one of those writers who feels very snobby about what I do. Um, I don't think that there's a high uh, bar for entry. I don't think that there needs to be uh, a bunch of steps where you say you have to do these six things before you can be considered a writer. No. A writer is a person who writes. If you are sitting down, you are writing, and you are telling stories, whether they're in fiction or nonfiction, fiction you're doing memoir or you know, telling a story about uh, your past, um, doing science fiction or fantasy or romance or western or whatever you're doing, if you are writing, you're a writer. Now, from there, you can say, well, you know, are you a professional writer, someone who gets paid? Are you an author who is specifically someone who has published a book? All of these different sorts of things um, can be different bars. But at the end of the day, a writer is someone who writes. If you're writing, you're a writer. My daughter has been writing since she was five years old. She's been a writer since she was five years old. It is not a thing um, that she needs to um, qualify. She, she is just that particular thing. Um, and so the snobbery of you know, who is a writer and who is not, um, I think it's just really, really silly. If it's something that you want to do and it is something that you have an interest in, it doesn't matter whether you ever publish it or not, um, the, you're a writer. You know, Emily Dixon, Dickinson took all her poems and stuffed them in a drawer and the vast majority of them were never published in her life. Was she a writer? <laughs> yes, she was a writer. Did anybody know that she was a writer outside of her immediate family while she was alive? No. But the simple fact of the matter is she was a writer. Um, so yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very uh, easy with who is a writer. You put in the pen to paper, you're sitting in front of a computer, you know, uh, you're doing those things, you're a writer. Mm -hmm.